Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Warships with the Mighty Jingles. Today we're going to be taking a look at the American Tier 3 protected cruiser, the USS St. Louis. The fourth ship to bear the name and not to be confused with this USS St. Louis or this USS St. Louis or in fact even this USS St. Louis which was actually the SS St. Louis but was commissioned during World War I as a troop transport and renamed the USS St. Louis. Not even this USS St. Louis, a Second World War vintage light cruiser, or this USS St. Louis, an amphibious transport ship. No, we are in fact talking about the USS St. Louis C-20, the lead ship of a class of protected cruisers in commission with the US Navy between 1906 and 1922. Why is it called the St. Louis and not the St. Louis? Well, because American. <laughs> I don't know. They're funny like that. It's named after the uh, city of St. Louis, Missouri. And that's how they pronounce it in America, so that's how we're going to pronounce it here. It's their ship, it's their city, it's their rules. Who are we to argue? What made the St. Louis class of cruisers, um, I hesitate to use the word special, but we'll say different, uh, was that the St. Louis was a development of the Olympia class cruiser, and it was designed to be a protected cruiser. However, due to a, a series of terrible decisions during the design process. It ended up being a sort of half-assed attempt at becoming an armoured cruiser that wasn't as good as an armoured cruiser and didn't have the speed of a protected cruiser. During the design phase they decided to increase the tonnage from 6,000 to 9,700 tonnes and in order to try to keep the speed up they decided to not equip it with the 8-inch guns which a normal armoured cruiser would have had but instead to give it 6-inch guns. Later on they then decided to add some extra belt armour onto the ship which you can see here along the sides, uh, turning it from a protected cruiser, which merely has armour on the deck above the boilers and the engine rooms, into a sort of half-assed version of an armoured cruiser. This of course slowed it down even further. So what they ended up with was a ship that was the same size as a full armoured cruiser, but without the speed, uh, without the full armour protection of an armoured cruiser, and without the firepower of an armoured cruiser. It wasn't a very successful ship design. Three of these ships were made, the USS St. Louis obviously being the lead ship in the class. The second ship in the class, the USS Milwaukee, was followed by the third and final St. Louis class cruiser, the USS Charleston. None of the St. Louis class of cruisers saw any kind of remarkable service. Uh, well, with the exception of the USS Milwaukee, the second ship in the class, which suffered a very embarrassing fate in 1916 while under the command of a temporary lieutenant. She was engaged in operations attempting to salvage a submarine that had managed to run itself aground off the coast of California. Uh, completely disregarding all advice from local sailors, the dipstick in charge of the USS Milwaukee also managed to run the ship aground off the coast of California in more or less exactly the same spot, and managed to do it so comprehensively that the ship was completely unable to be salvaged. The crew was taken off, the ship remained there for a year, at which point a storm rose up that was so severe it broke the ship in two, and that was the end of the USS Milwaukee. The USS St. Louis and the USS Charleston did see active service during the First World War, but only as convoy escort ships transporting troops from America to Europe. They both survived to be decommissioned. The Charleston, you can actually still see to this day, off Kelsey Bay on the north coast of Vancouver Island in Canada, where it was run aground and now sees out its days as a breakwater. So, not a particularly successful class of ship. Here in World of Warships, however, this is actually a very, very good Tier 3 cruiser. Now, don't get too carried away about all the talk I made about the armour being added to this ship during the design phase. It's still only 76mm of armour at the most. It's still going to get penetrated by just about any calibre of armour piercing that gets fired at it. But what makes the St. Louis special is the sheer firepower. Despite the fact that it only had 6-inch rather than 8-inch guns, it's the number of guns that this ship was fitted with. If you have a look at the modules, even the stock pre-1924 refit version of the St. Louis carries, let's have a look, there we go, 10 152mm guns, as well as the secondary battery armament which consisted of 18 76.2mm guns. When this thing was refitted in 1924, it increased the number of main battery guns from 10 to 14. This thing has more guns than the average survivalist living in the hills of Utah. 
And despite the fact that these are just six inch guns, they're not bad at all. They fire seven and a half rounds per minute. The 180 degree to turn time of 22.5 seconds is not good, but it doesn't actually matter because of where the guns are situated. We'll take a look at that in a moment. The maximum dispersion is only 105 meters, which isn't bad. It's not as good as on the Chester, but 105 meters is acceptable because of the sheer volume of firepower that you're throwing at the target. The maximum high explosive shell damage, 1,440. The maximum armor piercing shell damage, 3,340. The chance of fire on target caused by a high explosive shell, 7%. And again, because of the sheer amount of shells that you're firing at the target with all these guns, you stand a very good chance, if you're firing high explosive, of setting on fire whatever you're shooting at. And it has a respectable firing range of 10.4 kilometers. Now, I made mention of the 22.5 second 180 degree traverse of the guns of this ship, which is pretty slow, not really mattering at all. And it doesn't really matter because it only really applies to two of the 14 152mm guns that this ship is equipped with. And we're talking about this one here and that one there. They're the only guns that can rotate 180 degrees. They can actually rotate more than that, but. It doesn't matter because most of the guns on this ship are, as you can see, it's a First World War, it's actually a pre-First World War design. Most of the guns on the ship are mounted in the sides and they can't rotate 180 degrees anyway, so the stat is largely irrelevant. Now this is a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because it means that yes, the ship has 14 152mm guns, but it can never really bring to bear slightly more than half of them on a target at once because, well, the guns are all located in the sides. But it's a good thing as well because, let me give you a quick little example, let's say for example the ship is steaming in this direction and you were engaging uh, this ship over here in the port. That means that this rear gun has to rotate to point at that ship, this forward gun has to rotate to point at that ship, but none of the guns on the uh, starboard side here can fire at it, but all of the guns on the port side can. Now let's say you sink that ship and then suddenly another target pops up over here. This gun is the only gun on the ship that has to traverse more than 180 degrees in order to be able to be brought to bear on the next target which appears over here. The forward gun only has to rotate around about 90 degrees which it will do in 11 and a quarter seconds and all of these guns are just about ready to fire immediately. So, while you can never bring all 14 of these guns to bear on a target at once, you can almost always bring half of these guns to bear on a target very, very quickly. And that's what makes the St. Louis such a good little tier 3 cruiser. As far as the rest of the stats of the ship are concerned, it's, well, it's a bit of a mixed bag, and it's mostly bad. Um, thanks to the decision when this thing was being designed to increase the tonnage from six to 9,700 tons and add extra armor without adding much in the way of extra horsepower in the engine, it'll only do 22 knots, which is a pretty slow top speed for a, what's essentially a light cruiser. However, it's pretty maneuverable with an 8.4 second rudder shift time, which is the length of time it takes for the rudder to turn from full port to full starboard. For a ship with a limited top speed, it is actually pretty maneuverable at those low speeds. Its anti-aircraft armament is an utter disaster, but to be fair, it was designed at a time when nobody was taking aircraft seriously. It has eight 7.62mm magazine-fed machine guns. It's not going to be shooting any aircraft down. Concealment, uh, surface detectability range 11 kilometers, which is pretty bad, and an air detectability range of 6.3 kilometers. Those are the ranges at which it will be detected by other ships and aircraft, which is, again, nothing special. But what is special about the St. Louis is nothing to do with the armor, it's nothing to do with the speed, it's nothing to do with the stealthiness. It's that firepower. It's all of those guns. They may only be 6-inch guns, they may not be the 8-inch guns, which other cruisers of this size would typically be fitted with, but it's got a lot of them. And um, I'm going to show you what you can do with the guns on this ship when you put it in the right place at the right time. 
The matchmaking in this game has been particularly sadistic. I am a tier 3 cruiser and it's a tier 5 game. The enemy team do have one tier 3 ship and the rest are all tier 4 and 5 and that tier 3 ship is another St. Louis. They have a couple of guys in Awaki Alphas, which are the gift ship given to Alpha testers, so those two tier 4 cruisers are going to know what they're doing. They also have two aircraft carriers and more worryingly three tier 5 Congo class battleships with their eight 14 inch guns and in excess of 50,000 health each. More worryingly, those are fast battleships. Fully upgraded, they will do 31 knots. I can only do 22 knots, so if they decide to come after me, there is nothing I can do about it. The guns on the Congo can reach out and touch you at a range in excess of 21 kilometers. Although they are horribly inaccurate at that range, they only have to get lucky once. We only have two tier 5 ships in this game. One of them is a Congo class battlecruiser of our own, the other is an Omaha class light cruiser. The enemy team also has two carriers, we only have one. We do have more ships than the enemy, but they're all lower tier. So what do you do if you're in a St. Louis class cruiser in this kind of match? Well, you load the armor piercing and you make sure you're not the first ship that gets spotted. Although it's highly unlikely with a top speed of 22 knots that you are going to be the first ship that gets spotted unless the rest of your team all clusters around at the back of the map and you rush blindly forward. Well, I say rush forward, but um, nobody rushes anywhere in St. Louis, not with a top speed of 22 knots, but y you get the idea. You know what I mean. So what's happening here, looking at the map, is that most of our fleet is heading off to the south and west, and that's all of our tier 4 battleships, most of our cruisers, and all of our destroyers. Heading over to the eastern end of the map are three cruisers, two of them tier 3, and our lone Congo-class battleship. And we're going to run into most of the enemy battleships, and they're all tier 5s. There's one of the Congos, just been spotted, making its way around the headland over there, and you can see how quickly those things move. There's myself and a St. Louis, one of the cruiser, I'm not entirely sure what it is. There's another one of the Congos. They're already engaging our Congo at long range. And there's obviously an enemy destroyer up there somewhere as well. Somebody's laid that smoke screen, and this Congo is almost in my gun range. Come on. He's in range now, he disappeared, I fired a shot at his predicted... Oh, is that... Oh, that wasn't... That looks like... That looks like the enemy St. Louis. I did hit him. Didn't do a lot of damage. But you can see the number of enemy ships that are steaming around this side of the map, and... I need to start turning away. Uh, for two reasons. I don't want to be the one closest to them, and I want to be able to get the maximum possible number of guns turned and pointing towards these guys. There's torpedoes in the water, so there's definitely either a Japanese cruiser, could be one of those Awaki Alphas, or a destroyer over there. Actually, yeah, of course, the Awaki Alpha, the Alpha Test cruiser that was uh, given away as a gift to Alpha Testers, it, there's not necessarily a destroyer over there, because the Awaki is the only cruiser in the game that can lay a smoke screen. Now, there's a friendly cruiser off ahead of me who I really don't want to run into him, but I'm not going to sail straight towards these tier 5 battleships. And this was unfortunate. And potentially fatal. Um, it was as much my fault as it was his. He was obviously not paying any attention to me. I mean, I saw him coming. He obviously didn't see me coming, otherwise he would have turned to port in order to avoid the collision. He was obviously focusing on the ships that were behind him, but at the same time... I'm not going to continue steaming towards all of these tier 5 battleships just because he wasn't paying attention to where he was driving. So, an unfortunate collision, but didn't really do any real damage to either of us, and we both managed to get away with it. Oh, crap. That is not good. Well, it's not terrible because he's not focusing his guns at me. But it's not good all the same. This guy is now so close that we are pretty much both going to be within secondary battery fire range of each other. Luckily he's focusing his fire on that other St. Louis, but somebody is looping shots over the headland at me. I just took a very, very minor hit and I'm pouring all kinds of fire in... Oh, he's, he's turning his guns on me now. Oh, this is not good. 
I just did not, I wasn't paying attention to the map, I was more concerned with the collision that was about to happen and I did not see this Congo sneaking up on me and I can't run away from him. So it's just a quick, and I'm scoring some serious damage on this guy with my 152mm armour piercing, he's on fire, he's taking hits from three different directions. I'm doing a lot of damage to this ship and I'm only really taking return fire from his secondary batteries, you can see the spouts in the water there and there's some torpedoes coming in um yes he's down oh thank god for that because that could have gone very very badly for me but at the same time it was a terrible play from that battleship driver in the length of time it took him to reload his main 14 inch battery guns after firing one salvo and closing the close range with a bunch of enemy cruisers one of which was armed with torpedoes i was able to do over 20,000 damage to him before he could reload his guns and potentially sink me. This enemy Congo was in a slightly better situation but it's not that much better because he's still taking fire from multiple ships although the range is better he's not an immediate threat from ship launched torpedoes although having said that he is steaming right next to the map border which means he can't do a turn to starboard and can only turn to port if torpedoes come in so if anybody is lining up on him with a torpedo run it's going to make it very easy to predict which way he's turning you'll notice that i try to get into the habit of between shots pulling the camera back and looking at which way i'm going and you can see as I pulled the camera back there while peppering this guy with long range and surprisingly effective fire oh he's shooting at me and thankfully it missed well mostly missed but it's important that you do try to maintain situational awareness because if I hadn't pulled the camera back I wouldn't have known I was about to drive into that island until I had driven into it which is presenting a bit of a problem for me because I can't bring the maximum amount of guns to bear on this guy and there is also another two enemy ships coming around the headland of this island steaming towards me so I'm probably going to die here but I'm in a great position to get all kinds of broadside flanking fire into this other enemy Congo so I can't run away from whatever it is that I'm about to run into because I can only do 22 knots and the second I clear the headland of this island I'm probably dead but I'm pouring the fire into this guy and the damage that I'm doing is mounting up he's taken all kinds of sh oh here comes his main battery guns again and yeah so pretty inevitable that i was going to die there at 22 knot top speed and if the battleship hadn't finished me off those torpedoes definitely would launch from that japanese cruiser over there but i couldn't get away i'm not fast enough so i stayed in position and supported the rest of my ships by doing the maximum amount of damage possible to that very very high value target enemy battleship now this is our lone tier 5 battleship this is our congo and he's actually aiming his guns at that enemy cruiser rather than the Congo and at first I was watching this thinking what the hell are you doing finish off the Congo but the Congo is actually being engaged by our Mayogi class battleship and with one salvo at that mostly full health enemy cruiser this Congo just turned a bit into an artificial reef so what I thought was a particularly dumb move from this Congo driver turned out to actually be pretty smart indeed. Instead of focusing his fire on an enemy battleship that was already being fired upon by two tier 4 battleships and has just been sunk by them, instead he took out the torpedo threat and one-shotted that cruiser. Now he's going for the enemy St. Louis and this is likely to be a very, very one-sided engagement. The St. Louis is putting some fire into him and he unleashes a broadside and manages to miss with almost every shot <laughs> well that's battleship accuracy for you anyway let's see what's going on elsewhere because the congo is now steaming around the headland of this island and these two aren't going to be able to shoot at each other for a while so oh we found one of the enemy carriers let's go and have a look and see what this cruiser is going to do to him and it's another saint louis and this St. Louis has actually managed to find one of the only ships in the game that it can actually catch, the Langley Carrier, which is, has a slower top speed even than the St. Louis. And he's doing his best to sink this guy before the timer runs down as we're about to cap. The torpedo bombers are going in, but that Langley is going to live to fight another day, saved by the bell at the last second as we win by capping. So, the St. Louis Tier 3 Cruiser in a Tier 5 game scored 105 hits and earned 1,211 experience, undoubled, and without the benefit of a premium account, shooting mostly at Tier 5 battleships and doing a metric butt-ton of damage to them. 40,000 damage done, mostly to the Congos. In fact, the first Congo got so close that even my 76mm secondary batteries were able to do over 1,000 damage. 
The Chester at Tier 2 is not a bad little ship, but the St. Louis at Tier 3 is one of the rock stars of the American cruiser line. It's certainly not fast by any stretch of the imagination. 22 knots top speed is pretty bad, but while it isn't quick, and pretty much anything that decides to chase you is going to catch you, it's got the firepower to make anything that decides to chase you regret that decision. And I'm pretty sure that the driver of the first Congo-class battleship that I ran into in that match would agree. In the length of time it took him to turn his guns around and get them reloaded and pointed at me, the St. Louis managed to do more than its own health in damage to a battleship two tiers higher. So, that's the USS St. Louis, the Tier 3 American cruiser, and it's a real rock star of a gunship. Um, it really gives you the first taste of the kind of gun firepower that the American cruisers are famous for in World of Warships, and I think tier for tier this thing is only really equaled when you get to tier 10 with the Demoin class cruiser. That thing has multiple auto-loading gun turrets that dispenses democracy at a rate of 90 203mm packages of freedom per minute. It is an absolute beast, but I do think that down here at tier 3, tier for tier, you meet its match in the St. Louis. I hope you enjoyed the video folks, as always, take care and I'll catch you next time.